and made of silk and steel. Chapter 9 Asset is to acquire the target individual, minor male, age 7.5, in a remote location without witnesses or major fatalities. Target cannot be permanently inca incapacitated and conscious is preferable. Death or irreversible injury of the target will be considered failure and will result in punishment for asset and operatives. Minor believed to be accompanied by a fugitive adult male known to associates with male parent in the past. See DOD records attached. Threat level, medium to high, not enhanced or altered, highly trained, highly armed. Minor is enhanced through genetic in inheritance. See Matthew Michael Murdoch, Jessica Campbell Jones. Threat level, unknown, assume high. Known attributes, increased strength, speed, rate of healing, unknown threat evasion skill, require further study. Schedule interrogation inquiry ASAP upon acquisition. Sabotage successful, adult male is unconscious. Minor still functioning, injuries limited to surface damage only. Capture minor, reassess threat, minor, unknown, assume high, maximum. Mom? Mom. A woman with dark hair in blue. Mom. Ma. Adult male. Still conscious. Adjust. Asset is to acquire target individual. Minor male. Minor male. Minor. Peter? Peter. The boy repeats, tapping himself empath empathically on the chest. He gestures to the adult male in the driver's seat. Mr. Castle, then the canine. Max, can you say that, Edward? Dutifully, the asset recites, Peter, Mr. Castle, Max. He was unsure why this was important, but the boy seemed to think that it was, and Peter was important, so Edward would follow his direction. Edward? No, no, that is not the asset's name. His name is, his name, his name. Peter gives him a paper sack that he doesn't recognize, covered in strange red symbols he doesn't recognize. Here, I bet you're hungry. Hungry? What is hungry? Edward stares at the thing in his lap, confused. Then the smell hits him, savory, mouth-watering, and the pain that Edward was always had always been accustomed to feeling around his middle seems to double, triple, until it's gnawing at its guts like a beast. Peter watches in horror as Edward tries to eat the roast beef sandwich through the paper bag and its wrapper, french fries scattering as he tears through it. Stop! Wait! Stop! Stop! Edward froze, and when Peter looked up at him, madness stared back, his pale eyes wild in his haggard face until his blank expression looked more feral than any than empty. Peter, Castle said cautiously, slowing the car down, despite other people in, in their lane honking angrily all around. His neck twisted as he tried to keep one eye on the road ahead and one on the back seat behind him. We don't eat paper, Peter soothed, practicing the voice mom used on Tessa again, carefully moving his hands very slowly. He unwrapped the sandwich and showed it to him. See? Food. Update. The single word was said in a carefully clipped and controlled manner that leaves the lis that leaves the listener in no doubt about precisely how pissed off its speaker is. Sitwell nearly pissed his pants. We have no new information at, at the moment, sir. Pearson narrows his eyes and gives Jasper Sitwell a look so cold that it could freeze flames. You mean to tell me that you've lost not only an asset that has taken nearly my entire lifetime to secure and cost several million dollars in maintenance, but that you've now lost me 
another potential asset as well. Is that what you're telling me? Uh, what? Oh. Sitwell's mouth closed with a loud click of his teeth before his gaze drops to the floor. Yes, sir. The asset's electronic tracking and signaling seems to have malfunctioned. And his programming? Uh, unknown, sir. The technicians I've consulted believe he may have restor resorted back to his, um, original settings, so to speak. Aloud, Pierce thoughtfully mused. Yes, he usually does. Eventually, how long? What? How long will it take, you idiot? How long until the wipe ceases to take any effect on him? Oh, um, uh, they said they couldn't be sure, sir. Sitwell admitted. He was flushed and sweating heavily with terror. But Sitwell was still less terrorized than he might have been with the asset lost Hydra's boogeyman. Their agent of punishment and enforcement was now gone as well. He had no doubt that Pierce had other methods to ensure silence and loyalty, but none more terrifying and relentless than the man with the metal arm. Clearing his throat a little, Sitwell hastily added, It's assumed that the conditioning begins breaking down almost immediately after application, so probably less than 24 hours? Well, Pierce drawled and he flinched instinctively. What are you standing here for? Go get him. Pierce and Hydra in general should have been more attentive to the asset's previous handlers, the Russians. It was unfortunate that Secretary Pierce himself could not actually read or speak the language. If he'd been savvy enough to browse the documentation himself rather than reading a translator's summary. One of the things most emphasized in the miscellaneous sections of maintaining a, ref a reflexive control was that the asset should avoid any direct contact with civilian women, the elderly, the sick, and small children. When faced with someone much more vulnerable than itself, the asset had this strange habit of breaking food as the asset Edward discovered was amazing, maybe the best thing he's ever experienced. Peter watched with a mixture of fascination, horror, and thrilled disgust as Edward gracelessly demolished an entire pile of fast food sandwiches and french fries. Mr. Castle, he called, I think we're gonna need more roast beef. I think we ought to see what happens to this batch. Frank answered cryptically, glancing up into the rearview mirror to watch them. Peter didn't realize what he meant until half an hour later, when Edward violently retched into the now empty paper sack, stomach heaving with the entire meal back up in rejection. Frank watched this procedure expressionlessly as he leaned as he leaned as the parked Kia. Peter rubbed Edward's arm comfortingly, making soothing nonsense noises, and glared over his shoulder at Frank. You knew this was going to happen, he accused. Why why do you let him do that if you knew it was gonna make him sick? Because I didn't know, I guess. Frank countered, setting Max's water bowl down for the dog to drink from, and I wasn't about to find out what he'd do if I tried taking the food away. Before Peter could even open his mouth, Frank snapped. You sure as hell weren't doing it either. Be like putting your whole arm in a wolf's mouth. Peter took a moment to pout, still patting whatever part of Ed Edward's massive self was nearest. But well, why has he gotten so sick, Mr. Castle? Frank sighed. When somebody hasn't eaten much in a long time, letting them eat a lot will make them puke sometimes. His little face twisted into an expression of bewildered disbelief, and Frank had to bite down his laughter. Haven't you ever gotten sick before, ate something gross, gotten the flu? There was a moment be between him speaking, Peter 
answering where Frank realized the implications of the question were larger than Peter would understand. Nope, I've never gotten sick. Peter informed him, handing Edward a bottle of water. Drink it, please. Not even when Ned got chicken pox. Never gotten sick. It could be a child's affiliation for hyper for hyperbolic, or it could just be that Peter's memory didn't go far back enough to remember those sniffles and thor and sore throats of his toddler toddler years. But Frank had the terrible feeling it wasn't either of those. So part of his gifts from Matt and Jessica included making his immune system go hyperactive too. Fear, 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 fear freaking hell. Wonder the boy ate like a, like a freaking six and a half foot construction worker from the Bronx. The amount of energy he was using and expending just to maintain normal function had to be horrifying to any scientist who'd understand how to measure such a thing. It was amazing that wasn't either a skele a skeleton or a zoned out zombie like his new friend Edward. I'm sorry, Peter was telling the enormous the enormous cyborg he decided to adopt like a stray goddamn dog. We'll find something that won't make you feel so bad. Bad? Edward repeated hoarsely, looking puzzled. Yeah, you know. Peter gestured helplessly toward the paper bag and the bushes as well. Edward shrugged with an, if you say so kid, sort of look, increasing Frank's suspicion that this was perfectly normal to the idiot assassin cyborg kidnapper. Jesus Christ, he had to keep the kid away from this guy's original masters. If they were willing to beat and starve a man who could rip doors off of an SUV, what the hell would they do to a frightened child? Asset must blank target. Blank target? Target equal Peter. Do what with Peter? Information unknown. Inadequate data set. Acquire more for further assessment. Peter performs duties of a caretaker. Mom. Mom. A dark-haired woman with a soft, lined face and a dimple in her chin. In her chin, she wears a starched black skirt, and her smile is. Her smile is. Her smile is everything. Food and water and a soft pillow, and he can't hold on to her, but he wants to. He wants to so much. Why won't she stay? He just wants her to stay. Another woman, tiny and blonde and frail, laying back on a threadbare blanket. Her eyes are very, very blue. This is the last time he will ever see her. Though, he doesn't think he's ever seen her before. He does not know why this thought, memory, fills him with a much more terrible pain than the one in his gut. A pain that circles his throat like a hand and burns out of his eyeballs. Ed? Are you crying? Peter asked, concerned, with a touch of so gentle upon the appliance that Edward barely noticed it. Ma, he croaked, because she's important. They both are. He knows that they are, even if he can't remember why. Peter's face and posture softened. Like a stick of butter left out in the sun, he said, You miss your mom, Ed? Miss. Was that the pain he felt when he saw these women's faces? He nodded shakily, and Peter gave another feather-like pat on the arm, stroking the metal lightly and fearlessly as he handed Edward the bottle of water again. It's okay. Maybe we can find her, all right? Where does she live? Edward gave a small, helpless shrug, feeling more than a little uneasy that he couldn't give his handler the information requested from him. Still, the child gave him a tiny, reassuring smile. We'll look for her, okay? Asset must protect. 
targets. Peter Parker. Jesus Christ, he heard Castle whisper. Karen was right, you're an adult kryptonite. A parental nuclear bomb. What does that mean? Peter asked, scrunching his face up until he looked like a small baby monkey. It means you've just made a, the brain-dead cyborg imprint on you like a newly hatched duckling. Castle said cryptically. At Peter's blank expression, he sighed. It means you both need to get back to the damn car. We'll find something Ed can eat, all right? All right, Mr. Castle. And if Edward were more aware of social interactions, he might have heard the note in his voice that indicated Peter was humoring Castle. Edward has this thing that has the same consistency as water, but tastes like meat. And he feels a lot better. Kind of sleepy though, and Peter is sleeping against the appliance, mouth open, in a way that would be very uncomfortable if Edward had any sensation in it. But Edward is not allowed to sleep. He is not permitted to eat either, but Peter had ordered him to, so he supposed that he did deserve the stomach cramps. Oct, octahubka. He barked, standing in the moving vehicle and startling both Peter and Max into full wakefulness and making Castle swear loudly in the driver's seat. Edward punched through the roof of the car, shoulder turned forward into the path of the bullet that would have full on struck Castle in the forehead if he were still sitting down. Below heard even more colorful language from Castle, who was forced finally to slam on the brakes. What in the ever, what in the ever fucking love of Jesus fucking Christ, Ed? Peter gasped. Mr. Castle, Ed is bleeding. Yes, Peter, because someone just fucking shot him. Get down, you motherfucking moron. Ed ignored him. For Peter, he might have obeyed, but Castle he viewed as more like the technicians. Ed was not supposed to hurt him, but Castle's instructions were ultimately meaningless. Besides, it was only a graze. He reached forward, catching another bullet meant for Castle and letting the round bounce off his metal fingers. The force of it enough to leave his left shoulder aching. I'll handle it, he informed Peter seriously, still staring at Ed wide-eyed through the hole in the roof because that was what he was supposed to do. That was his job now. The hell you will, Castle yelled in the front seat. Ed continued ignoring him and hauled himself out of the car. Easy, Murdoch, Jess muttered, letting Matt drop onto the couch and wincing as she looked at his bruised everything. Did you mouth off to someone who corrected you with their fists again? Trish sputtered in outrage. Who the hell beats up a blind man? Oh, you'd be surprised, Matt said. With such dry humor, Jessica choked on a laugh that would have been wildly out of context for anyone but the Defenders and Nelson or Paige. Trish, out. She said instead, with a take a hike gesture toward her bedroom. Was Salinger now in lockup after Matt and Jess found the evidence they were looking for? Lots of credit to Nelson for that one. Eric had gambled enough but a motel room away from angry Jessica and her angry baby, baby dad Matt. And even not angry Jessica would not care that she had basically driven a guest out of her home. So angry Jessica definitely wasn't going to give a shit. No, Tessa, not you. Lay down, good girl. She was still expecting her former sister to argue with her. Instead, Trisha's eyes darted back and forth from her to Matt. Oh, okay, she said in the most totally unsubtle way possible, because Matt was apparently deaf as well as blind. Good night. Matt sighed, rolling his head towards Jess. Her figure is a tall, fiery blur to his useless vision. She thinks we're going to have sex on this couch, doesn't she? I don't know why people think I'm the one with no class. She complained and it was so heartfelt that Matt was startled into nearly a full minute of laughter. 
She dropped next to him on the sofa, crossing her arms over her chest. And she started, and she stared at the television without really seeing it, each of them leaning into the other's side. You are really gonna have to stop it, she said quietly, and allowed herself the rare moment of softness to rest her head on his shoulder and get her, her point across. Nelson and Paige will throw a fit if they need you to be at court and your face looks like this, Murdoch. At this rate, he'll come back home in time to visit you in the hospital. I'm sorry, he said, just as quietly. And that was all he could manage because Matt knew, didn't he? He knew that he shouldn't be doing what he was doing, but also didn't know what else to do when he felt this helpless. Don't apologize, at least not to me. She muttered, I've been standing right there with you, haven't I? I'm a, what do they call it? I'm your enabler. He could practically feel her sneer and freed his hand long enough to gently touch the top of his, her head. If I don't have to apologize, you can't call me your, your enabler. He said calmly, because without you screaming good sense in my ear, I'd probably already be in the hospital. Huh, she grumbled wordlessly. Do you know something? Matt said, blinking up at a, at a ceiling he couldn't see. I love you, Jess. Uh, she said, tense as a cat over a tub of water. Please say psych. Nope. He said and elbowed her lightly in the ribs. No takesies backsies. Are you? She said through a laugh. He could hear her try to suppress. Did you honestly just hit me with something that lame? Did you seriously just tell me please say psych? There was a long pause. I'm not gonna say it back, she said finally, but yeah, Murdoch. Yeah, me too. I can't imagine having to do this with anyone else. He sat up straighter, suddenly hand gripping the back of the couch with white knuckles. Turn the volume up, Jessica. Jess's eyes focused on the screen for the first time and her scream made Tessa cower beneath the coffee table and sent Trish bolting out from the master bedroom in a hair raise, raising panic. Holy shit. Clint's floor was, by unspoken agreement, a place no mortal man would ever wish to go. The man couldn't find his keys if they had actual teeth to bite him with. He only did the laundry when his choices were boxers or complete nudity, and Tony no longer employed housekeepers on the Avengers residential levels because having strange people in their own personal spaces tended to make his other teammates very twitchy in a way that was quite deeply unsettling even to the, mo to the most intrepid, intrepid of domestic staff. Of course, being fit for no mortal meant that Natasha was there every single day and Tony on every second Wednesday just to make sure the man was still alive. Clint's diet of bodega beef jerky sticks and entire pots of black coffee? Why is it called Death Wish, Clint? Clint, why is the coffee called Death Wish? Made even Tony examine his life choices, so someone had to. Today's visit found Clint and Natasha watching the news while Steve made something in the kitchen. Apparently their earth, earthwhile team leader thought that a man who serves himself a beverage called Death Wish needed to be mothered. It was precious. It really was. Anyway, it was the first time he'd actually been able to walk all the way down the hallway without tripping over archery equipment since Clint had moved it. Don't you think that we should get called in? He heard Clint say as he rounded the corner. By the time we got there, they'd be gone. Natasha replied, but there was an odd, tight tone in her voice. What's going on, bird brain? It was, it was some kind of high-speed chase. 
that had been rec recorded by highway traffic cameras somewhere in Missouri. Man, that car had seen some shit. Natasha saw an old friend, Clint said a bit flippantly, but the same odd note was in his voice too. Doesn't look much like a ghost, Nat. Dude looks pretty real to me. What the hell? Tony said, bug-eyed. That's my mini-me, my iron baby. Why the hell is a bleeding cyborg running down a Missouri High Freeway with my iron baby? That's the Winter Soldier, Natasha said calmly, through, though her eyes looked concerned. Tony wasn't quite sure how, but he was certain he could tell the difference now. She let out a slow breath. The intelligence community used to think he's a ghost. The intelligence community? Tony repeated, eyes narrowed. But not you? We've met, she stated flatly. His handlers must be planning to terminate him. There's no way they'd let him make such a public-facing mess otherwise. Either that, or they think the kid is worth it, Clint murmured, reminding him again that Mr. Iowa was a lot smarter than he looked. God only knows why. Wasn't he missing just a few days ago? Tony turned back to the kitchen. If his mini-me was in trouble, he wanted to help, damn it. Catwoman and Batman be damned. The cat was frozen in the doorway with an empty plate held loosely in one hand. The scrambled eggs that used to be on the plate had slid down to the floor at his feet, which Tony totally would have made a quip about if Steve didn't look exactly the way he imagined someone having a stroke looked. Cap? Cap, come on, we have a strict limit of one heart condition per team around here. The word was extracted from him, whisper soft and with agony ringing through it. Bucky. End of chapter.